I'm going to talk to you about um, anemia and about anemia before um, big operations, which is what most of us are interested in. Um, tiny bit of extra background. So I, my PhD is, is sort of loosely linked to um, anemia and some of the studies certainly were directly linked to it. But I set up um, the anemia service in Nottingham, sorry, in Southampton um, about uh, five or six years ago. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk in depth about that, but happy to take any questions uh, afterwards. So. Um, just a couple of disclosures. I've had money from all of the companies that uh, treat anemia, basically, um, for various different things. So, anemia in the purpose of states. I think um, if you'd asked me perhaps two years ago, um, I think you would have had a fairly sort of tidy, packaged answer as to what I think you should do um, with an anemic patient who presents to you, either in the pre assessment clinic or hopefully uh, you know significantly before in the patient patient pathway um i think that's slightly muddied at the moment um, and it'd be interesting to hear people's thoughts perhaps at the end about kind of where we are um <clears throat> i also think that um you know these things swing around don't they so if you go back to the 1970s and compare what was done then and then compare kind of in the, i guess the late 90s uh, then to now we've kind of been through a bit of a journey with what we think we should do versus what we actually do do um, I mean I can certainly remember um, in the early 2000s up at the top of QMC there used to be a little pre-assessment area um, I can't remember what the ward was called but it was the diarrhea ward or the C. diff ward it became but as a house officer at QMC you used to go up and see the colorectal patients before their operation and if they had a hemoglobin of say um, eight eight because it was eight at the time already, um, you'd write them up for a couple of units and they may or may not get admitted depending on which um, consultant you spoke to so <clears throat> I think things have probably moved on a little bit from that um, and there are some things that we can definitively say have a strong evidence base or are good practice but I think there's still a lot of stuff that if we're completely honest um, we can't say that about um, I think um, I think we have an idea of what we ought to do but um, a lot of that stuff is not clear. I think it is fairly clear that pre-operatively um, and intraoperatively, um, unless there's acute blood loss, it's probably not good to give these patients blood. OK, and I say probably because that's not even even that isn't it isn't super definitive. OK, um, so what is anemia? I'm not going to kind of <clears throat> teach you to suck eggs, but anemia as defined by the WHO, again, is, is a little bit controversial, and I'm sure many of you know that that's been challenged in recent years. And the AAGBI guidance, which um, Austin Acheson certainly was part of, who, who obviously works here. Um, I don't know if Ian's uh, listening in as well, because Ian obviously has a rich uh, and strong history in, in looking at this in, in fractured neck of patients. But um, there's some debate about whether or not we should be treating all patients um, uh, as, as 130, basically. Uh, women have a, a lower blood volume, so if they lose blood in, in surgery, and, and everyone talks about the kind of mythical 500 mil blood loss being significant, but if you lose 500 mils from a proportionately lower blood volume, that's going to be more significant. So if anything, you should argue that we should we should be more um, you know, preemptive with treating women who are anemic. And of course, um, having sort of been in this world for, for quite some time, um, I've had a number of colleagues who've come to me um, who are anemic, um, almost exclusively female, um, and many of them have had treatment and it's kind of been quite life changing. So from a sort of slightly bias perspective, I think there are some anemic therapies which, uh, you know, do actually really make a difference. Um, so the patients that we see, so if you look at kind of, I, I do a lot of major general surgery, so um, HPB, um, upper GI, things like that. And, uh, you know, the, the, the etiology is often mixed. I'm sure you know that. And if you look at all comers in the perioperative space, varying reports in the literature, but it's about 30% of all comers. If you look at colorectal surgery or surgeries where there's a tumour in the GI tract, um, obviously the incidence is higher. It's probably more like 40%. Um, and that's what we see, isn't it? Even if you're talking about low level or low grade anemia, so somebody perhaps with a haemoglobin of 110 to 115, that you think, well, does this really matter? Do I need to do anything about this? 
Um, about 10 to 15 percent of those patients who are iron deficient, and by iron deficient, I mean classically iron deficient, so a ferritin of below 100, a transferrin saturation of below 20 percent. Um, though 15 percent of those patients will also be B12 and or folate deficient. So if you don't look for it, you don't find it. And I think part of the, um, I guess, story or jigsaw puzzle with anemia that's interesting is if these patients present in general practice um, and they're found to be B12 or folate deficient, the, the therapy for that is cheap and simple and they will just get started on that therapy. Now, as far as I know, there's no evidence at all in the literature to support treating B12 or folate deficiency in terms of perioperative patients and in terms of outcome benefits. Um, but I think you'd be hard pressed to argue that it wasn't a great idea. Now, obviously, the same doesn't neatly apply to either oral iron or to intravenous iron. And I'll talk a little bit more about both of those therapies um, in a while. So just to start, I guess, at the start of the story with um, anemia and, and perioperative space. Um, is having a low haemoglobin actually bad for you? Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, we've talked about men and women. If you go back to the TRIP trial, which was published in 1999, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, looked at different transfusion thresholds in, in a sort of critical care environment. So really looking at seven and nine or 70 and 90. Um, and really, before the TRIC trial published, I think it's probably fair to say that most people aimed for a haemoglobin of around 100. Um, and that was in all comers, in, in unwell patients in critical care or in elective patients perioperatively. And the TRIC trial did really change that because it kind of, I guess, brought that you know, into question. And subsequently, there's been uh, a whole raft of studies that have tried to replicate uh, similar methodologies looking at um, restrictive versus liberal transfusion tributes. And they all kind of say the same thing to a point. I mean, let's leave um, acute coronary syndrome out of the picture for a moment and let's leave cardiac surgery out yes. because they are probably two unique, slightly unique settings and it's very, very debatable. And we could, I could talk all day about the, um, the literature with regard to that, but I'm not going to because it's going to be boring. So I'll move on. This is a really, really interesting paper. Um, some of you will be familiar with this. This was published in 1996 in The Lancet by Jeff Carson. Uh, Jeff spent his whole research career um, looking at transfusion medicine, really. Um, and they they trawled through um, loads and loads of Jehovah's Witness patients, OK? And they looked back retrospectively and they said, well, what happened to them? So these are patients who um, obviously refused to have a blood transfusion. And it's pretty clear cut that their mortality was much, much higher. And there seemed to be a cutoff point at around six grams per deciliter or 60 grams per liter, whereby your mortality, um, you know, the, the kind of the curve sharply rose. Um, so it's pretty clear that if you have a very, very low haemoglobin at some point, um, you, you, you will die. And if you look at all of the kind of common things we measure in terms of morbidity, so renal failure, um, infection, time on a ventilator, hospital length of stay, they all get worse. Um, and the thing, the thing that's really fascinating about this is there's quite a clear biological gradient. So it seems to be um, related to the actual level. Uh, and then as it drops below six, it, it does get significantly worse. Um, so, that's fine. So, um, you know, being really, really anemic is really bad. But is giving blood, so allergenic blood, is that bad? Um, I think, I guess if you if you take the literature from the last sort of five to ten years, um, I would say it's trendy or popular or perhaps even my own bias would say that probably blood is not great. And there's a whole raft of reasons for that. So there's the normal obvious stuff like giving the wrong blood to the wrong patient, so transfusion reactions and such. Um, then there's the whole immunological story, and there is definitely something in that. Um, and then there's the whole question of, well, if you give a patient blood, what are you actually doing? Are you just increasing their circulating blood volume or are you giving them a useful oxygen carrying mechanism? And at what point does banked blood given into a patient actually become useful? If you think about the way in which blood is stored, there's been a whole um, huge piece of um, research literature about the age of blood and whether that makes a difference, the kind of um, things that it's mixed with, the amount of 2,3 DPG. There's a whole number of factors which may or may not blo make blood useful, but as far as I'm aware, and I'd be I'd be delighted if anyone knows any research on this, 
Um, when you give uh, somebody some blood that's not theirs from a bag, um, when does that haemoglobin become a useful oxygen delivery mechanism? So it might take oxygen around the body, um, but when can that actually be utilised by cells? And there's not an eloquent way of measuring that. So my grow cop, who um, is the person I did my PhD with, did some quite interesting stuff on Everest, where they looked at um, electron microscopy uh, of the kind of capillaries under the tongue and looked at um, the kind of blood rheology and tried to get a picture of, um, you know, what was going on with when haemoglobin was actually a useful oxygen carrier. And if you go back to the 80s and actually the 70s, um, people were really interested in, in using non-blood mechanisms of getting haemoglobin. So sort of these, um, I guess, uh, you know, laboratory manufactured solutions. Uh, they had awful problems with anaphylaxis and they never really sort of took off. Um, anyway, back to the, the present day. So this paper, which is Jeff Carson and Simon Stanworth, who's an NHSBT haematologist um, in Oxford, um, look, did a big uh, Cochrane uh, review of, um, uh, you know, blood transfusion, essentially. And they found that actually um, infections, so wound infections, for example, there was actually no difference between restrictive and, and liberal transfusions, whereas a lot of us had always thought that there was. So if you speak to someone like Simon, um, he's a bit of a fan of, of blood and, and probably wouldn't say that it's it's all that bad. So I think that the jury's out. I think it's, it's really, really clear cut to say, well, blood is, is bad for you, uh, although I do probably think uh, it is. Um, so Austin, who I don't, again, I don't know if he's on the call and, and probably some of you do Austin's list. Um, he showed uh, probably 10 years ago now that um, even giving small amounts of blood actually worsens your um, colorectal cancer recurrence rate. Um, and it was associated with a higher morbidity and a higher mortality, uh, not to mention um, worsening infection, which is then been debated. Depends who you ask, I think. But um, there is evidence for poor outcomes if you're anemic. And that's pretty clear cut. Um, and again, uh, Austin was involved uh, in some of this research and there's there's a whole a raft of it. So uh, Ferraris showed um, that even giving one unit intraoperatively worsens your outcome. And when when I say worsens your outcome, it's, it's pretty much across the board. So if we look at those standard metrics, mortality, renal failure, length of stay, incidence of infection, all of them are worse. Uh, and this was a massive study. This was the um, uh, the ENSQIP data from the States, which was probably one of the first massive registries uh, that was looking at this stuff. Uh, and that was that was kind of across the United States. Obviously, it's observational uh, stuff, but it's still very, very interesting. And it's dose dependent. That's, uh, so more more stuff about outcomes. So prior to this talk, I just thought I'll just have a quick look to see if there's anything that I, I'm not aware of that's happened recently. And I came across this paper, which um, was fascinating, actually, because it's um, I think these guys are from China. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they looked at um, the long term outcomes from colorectal cancer for patients who'd um, had a blood transfusion versus ones who hadn't. And again, they found that, uh, you know, quite significantly the outcomes were worse. Now, this is, again, not in the context of a randomized controlled trial, but still nonetheless very, very interesting. So I've talked about this briefly. Does giving blood intraoperatively do any good other than its colloid effect? Um, I think it's, it's hard to answer slash impossible to answer, and I don't think anyone has ever eloquently answered this. And um, we all know because we work in major trauma centres that when people come in, uh, you know, in, in, in gross shock, they, they've lost their circulating volume. You have to do something um, whether you give them um, warmed crystalloid like ATLS still says or whether you give them blood. Um, I actually don't think it massively matters, although we do think it's sensible to give blood and that's kind of what we do. But does it make a difference? I don't think we know. If you have a patient with having a pelvic exenturation and they start to bleed um, and you suddenly have lost three or four litres in the surgery, we all give that patient blood. Um, but is that the right thing? I don't think we know the answer to it, if I'm honest. There's some really interesting, very, very low grade of evidence stuff about this. So there's case reports. You're never going to get a randomised trial on this. But but this guy um, is quite, it's quite an interesting story. It's, it's a, I think it's in Japan. It's a 53 year old chap who was stabbed and he bled down to a haemoglobin of 0.7 grams per deciliter, which is obviously crazy low. Um, and for, for some reason, reading the paper, I think there was a problem with his cross match or something and they couldn't get this guy blood. Anyway, he's he survived um, with 
sort of you know you know standard kind of um, intravenous fluid therapy. Um, that's one case, but it it just kind of highlights that um, you can survive uh, without blood to a point in the acute setting anyway. So whilst it's attractive to believe that transfusion should be beneficial to anemic patients, there's actually a glaring lack of evidence to support that. Um, and the hypothesis that transfusion has clinical benefits uh, it just, just isn't, isn't really there. Um, and this, I can't remember where I got this quote from, but blood transfusion is like a marriage. It should not be entered into lightly, unadvisedly or wantonly, or more often as absolutely necessary. And I know in our trust, we've had a real push in recent times for the one unit transfusion. So I don't know if that's the same at NUH, but you kind of, if you're in theatre and someone's bleeding to death, you can kind of bypass that and you can ask for the, the trauma pack. But out there on the wards, um, you can only order one unit at a time. Uh, I think the, you know, in um, upper GI hemorrhage, you can, again, you can circumnavigate this, but but the, the principle is that you give one unit and you recheck. Um, and I think that's probably a, a fairly wise, um, well, it's a, it's a cost saving exercise for NHSBT, but there's also a massive shortage of blood. And I think at the moment, there's acutely a, a shortage of O negative blood, which is a real problem. Um, so uh, another another misconception about anemia, which I'm sure none of you have, um, is that the prevalence of anemia in the general population is the same as that in the surgical. It's actually not. It's, it's considerably higher in the surgical population. So the, the prevalence worldwide of any, you know, is very high of anemia because of hookworm infection. But if you if you look at the general British population, it'd be much lower than 30 percent. It'd probably be more like five to 10 percent. Well, not even that. Um, but it's a lot higher, especially in the elderly. So in terms of, um, I guess, like anemia treatment, uh, you know, is it the same as everything else? Is it the same as deconditioning and prevalence of diabetes, prevalence of heart problems, presence of renal failure, presence of COPD? You know, we see patients who are multi-morbid and increasingly so, and often it, it makes intuitive sense to ask a patient to lose weight or to stop smoking or to start exercising or to ensure that their diabetic care is better so that their HbA1c is not 100 uh, prior to their big resection. All of that stuff makes sense, doesn't it? And, and in I guess in that vein or in that trail of thought, uh, everybody thought that treating anemia would be a good thing to do. So we have a problem. Anemia is bad. We know that from the big observational studies that, that have been mentioned. But blood is probably bad, although we could we could debate that. Um, and population studies in the UK have shown that anemia is actually more prevalent than diabetes, which is shocking, really, um, with a similar incidence to that of, of cardiovascular disease. Now, I don't know whether they are including hypertension within that, but I don't know. <clears throat> so outcomes. So these are the two key papers that showed that anemia uh, in the perioperative space meant you did worse. OK, one is um, Khaled Musalem's paper and one is um, Barrett's paper which was part of the, from the USOS study that uh, Rupert Pierce did. This was a, a subset analysis, uh, a predefined subset analysis of that paper. But both of them really big numbers and showed a clear uh, outcome, you know, worse outcomes if you're anemic, all right? Um, but, and, and this is still, I think, true, Rupert Pierce commented at the end of uh, another paper, or a systematic review actually on this, that it remains unclear whether anemia is an independent risk factor for poor outcomes, or is it simply a marker of the underlying chronic disease? Um, however, red cell transfusion is much more frequent among anemic patients. So it's clear that if you're anemic and you have surgery, you're more likely to get a transfusion, depending on which centre you work in actually. But what we don't know, and I think still remains unanswered, is whether it's the anemia in and of itself that's causing these bad outcomes, or whether it's just a sort of marker for the the other you know diseases that are causing the anemia, and that's really difficult to tease out. So, as I said, anemic patients are much more likely to get a transfusion. Uh, in some of the literature, it's, it's ten times more likely, um, and I think you you will know this from from being consultant anaesthetist in an acute hospital in the UK. If you have an anemic patient, they're more likely. To Blood. So the Australian benchmark study found you're three times more likely, and that's the last study. So we've had loads of guidance, okay, in the last ten years of what to do, and there's lots of uh, very, very esteemed bodies. I don't know if Mike Nafe's on the call, but 
for AAGBI um, put out guidance, which Austin was one of the senior authors on. Um, and they're good, you know, they're all they're all good. They're, they're all different slightly, um, but these all came before Prevent. So NICE uh, came out with a consensus statement in December 16, um, and the AGBI also updated their guidance on this in, in 16. I think the, um, the paper was published in Anesthesia at the same time. No, sorry, slightly later, the, the paper in Anesthesia, but the, the bottom line was, um, I guess this gave people and trusts and uh, perioperative services a bit of a green light really to, to push on and treat these patients and I'm interested to know what you do locally but certainly in Southampton we are pretty active in treating patients um, who are anemic preoperatively but if we were totally honest there was still a bit of a lack of evidence as to whether or not there was an outcome benefit and I would say probably uh, there still is um, so I won't go over these in detail, but there are a number of studies. They were all really small, uh, one of which um, was done by Ian Moppet in patients with uh, neck of femur fractures that looked at treating anemia with intravenous iron. And I'll focus on intravenous iron, but simply because that's where most of the data is. So there are papers looking at combined therapies. So um, certainly Don Atspan has done a load of work with EPO, B12, intravenous iron, various other things. but. I'm going to focus really on intravenous iron. So Austin's paper, which was published uh, in the British Journal of Surgery, um, that's the Avica trial for those who aren't familiar, well worth a read. That was a randomised trial uh, and that was one of the first ones done in this area. That was in, in colorectal cancer uh, and they showed there was no difference, no difference between uh, blood transfusion um, and uh, they did find a slightly better haemoglobin in the, the IV iron group, but it was a small study and it was possibly underpowered. Um, they've since gone back and looked at quality of life data uh, and really interesting. So I think this is two years ago, they published a paper looking at quality of life for the patients who received intravenous iron versus the ones who didn't. Um, and they found that the quality of life was increased. And, and the reason that that's interesting is because patients care about that. Patients care about how they feel. Uh, are they tired? Are they exhausted eight weeks post their anterior reception at home? Um, and it appears that they, they feel better. And that fits in very neatly with a lot of the data we have from the heart failure cohort of patients and also from the renal failure cohort. There's, there's a raft of quality of life data, certainly in heart failure, showing that intravenous iron has a, a positive uh, impact on, um, on quality of life indices. Um, and then there's this study, which is um, also sort of makes me sigh, really. Um, so Bernd Frosler, this was done in Australia. They sort of replicated um, Austin's methodology. Or I don't know if they did it at the same time, but virtually the same study. Um, and they found this staggering um, improvement um, in, in their primary endpoint, which was reduction in blood transfusion. So they one group had iron, one group um, didn't. I can't remember whether they had oral iron or, or nothing. But basically they found such a profound reduction in blood transfusion that the trial was stopped early, which was so disappointing because it therefore was underpowered. So unfortunately, this this went through a kind of fairly rigid um, process where they had uh, you know, the ethics committee and they had to get a third independent person. But for the, the bottom line was the trial was stopped early. So although they had this such staggering uh, reduction, um, it, it, it wasn't a powered trial. Now, the, the interesting thing is that locally, when we started running our service, we found the reduction in blood transfusion was somewhere in the middle. So you've got Austin, Austin's paper where it was zero, uh, there was no difference. You've got this paper where there was a 60% reduction. We found locally from our first probably 200 or 300 or so patients that our, our reduction in blood transfusion was about 35%. Um, and that kind of made us feel quite good because we thought, well, actually, we're somewhere in the middle. That might be the right value now. Whether it is the right value or not, I have no idea. Um, this is Ian's paper. I don't know if Ian's listening in. I'm not going to I'm not going to critique it in detail, but this was a, a pilot randomised trial, really. And they gave um, three doses of, of Venifer, which is a slightly older uh, iron product uh, and quite a small dose. And they were looking at really feasibility, I think, really, because they look at their, their primary outcome measure was retic count. It'd be interesting to, for Ian to describe that in more detail rather than me yabber on about it. Um, and then we have Prevent. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Prevent, certainly the people 
um, who do uh, preoperative stuff at NUH will have will have been aware of this paper. Um, I recruited patients to prevent. I was sort of quite involved in uh, in helping the trials succeed. I'm not an author on the trial. I have no vested interest in it at all. I do know the authors well. But, uh, you know, PREVENT has basically a sort of, for those that don't know, it was a big randomised trial um, giving intravenous iron to patients preoperatively. However, the criteria at the time when PREVENT started was only in open surgery. And the reason for that was they felt that open surgery patients were more likely to bleed, more likely to be anemic, more likely to need blood. Um, but, of course, from the time that PREVENT started recruiting to now, uh, the amount of open surgery done was, was less and less. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, PREVENT had loads of problems that I don't have time to go into in detail. Uh, but the, the findings of PREVENT really were quite interesting because they're quite surprising to the authors. So they found that in the IV iron group versus the normal, normal treatment group, there was no difference in the primary outcome of measure. OK, so the bottom line is uh, giving if, if you look at if you crudely look at PREVENT and say, you know, did what did PREVENT show? It showed no difference in, in blood transfusion, no difference in length of stay, no difference really in anything. OK. And I'll talk about the, the one thing that they did find in, in a bit. Um, so do we think intravenous iron is a good thing? Um, so uh, I, I, I think probably it is. Um, I think it depends what you're trying to measure. OK, so quality of life, I think, is a decent thing to measure because patients care about it. Managers and people funding services are less interested in that because it doesn't necessarily reduce length of stay or get patients out of hospital quicker. Length of stay is traditionally incredibly um, fraught with, with problems in any uh, perioperative trial because length of stay is so dependent on other factors, um, very much institutionally driven, surgeon driven, setup driven, family circumstances driven. There are so many factors that, that affect length of stay, um, uh, anemia possibly being one of them. Um, it's not just about reducing blood transfusion. There's, there's plenty of other things that IVI may or may not do. Does it improve exercise capacity? I looked at this as part of my PhD. Um, we found that it did. That's un unpublished data, hopefully to be published soon. But we found that improve your um, your performance on the CPEP bike. Um, does it reduce readmission? So the one thing that Prevent did show, um, and they didn't look for this, so it wasn't powered for it as such, um, was that it did reduce readmissions. Now, that could have well been just a chance finding, but they've kind of latched on to that because it was the only thing that they could talk, I guess, positively about in the paper. Um, and, uh, you know, are there some other patient reported outcome measures which we, we haven't really looked at or thought about? And I just wonder whether um, actually we're missing a bit of a trick here and there's some other factors that, that are going on at a cellular level um, which we, we haven't really eloquently looked at. So I'm, I'm a fan. I, you know, I think IVI is a good thing. Uh, um, and I think if you're really, really iron deficient, um, you should have some treatment. Whether you have that before your operation, during your operation or after is, again, debatable. So what were the problems with prevent? OK, so first of all, um, blood transfusion, um, should that be um, the, the primary outcome measure? I would argue um, pretty strongly that it shouldn't be. Um, I think the decision for blood transfusion um, in an acute hospital, certainly in this country, uh, is often taken out of hours by junior medical staff who aren't necessarily uh, the direct care team for that patient. So post-operatively, someone's on HDU, uh, they'd say they're day three, part post their big resection, haemoglobin is 79, and the SHO um, says, oh yeah, that's well, the nurses say, look, I think we should give some blood. The SHO says, yeah, it sounds reasonable. They get some blood. There, there's not always this kind of eloquent, really in-depth, highbrow conversation. It's just you, you treat these patients matter of factly. Um, should we be looking at quality of life? Yes, definitely. Should we be looking at readmission and wound infection? Prevent would say possibly. This is really key timing. So in prevent, the the IV iron was given, I think, um, you know, too soon prior to the date of surgery. So they caught the patients too late and they would argue, oh, it was a pragmatic trial. That was the only way we could do it. We wanted to roll this out to multiple centres. There was no way we could get this 
highly functioning pathway. And 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 they're, they're right to some extent, uh, you know, doing these big trials is really challenging and really difficult, and I'm not for one moment knocking it. Um, we've managed to do it a different way um, in one centre, so we catch our patients way, way further down the line and treat them at the time of endoscopy, weeks you know, pre-MDT, so some of these patients don't even have surgery. So it's it's possible, and I, I'm convinced that they just didn't, it just didn't have long enough to work. That's, that's one problem. Um, they also, the dose was too low, um, so again, I recognise the pragmatic nature. You had to sort of standardise, give the same dose. I'm not arguing or, or disrespecting it in any way. But they only found a pretty modest rise in, in haemoglobin in the IV iron group. So it was 4.7 grams a litre. Now, um, we've shown, you know, in our cohort, it's, it's double that, easily double that, sometimes more. Um, so it, it was low, so I'm not surprised there wasn't a real difference in any of the, the metrics, to be honest, because the groups were very similar. But the most uh, probably... <laughs> I guess the striking thing was that the patients in Prevent weren't all iron deficient. So if you're giving an intervention to treat a problem that's not there, it's not surprising that you're not going to see uh, an outcome, um, you know, change. So I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think there were a lot of non-informative patients in, in the trial, okay? So only 17% of the patients included in Prevent had a haemoglobin of less than 100. Now, um, I can't quote evidence on this, but from my own experience, the biggest changes are in patients below 100, without a doubt. So patients who come in with a ferritin of 5, a haemoglobin of 70, you treat them with IVI and you see them three weeks later and the haemoglobin's had a, a jump of, say, 30 grams a litre. It's pretty impressive. Um, I've mentioned already a lot of them weren't actually anemic. So, um, I mean, the mean level between the groups was 111, which is very mildly anemic. And they actually excluded patients who were very anemic. And again, I don't, I can't remember speaking to Toby. I can't remember the rationale at the time for that, uh, but that was the decision chosen. But it's only 80% of the included anemic patients in the intervention group still suffered from anemia uh, when, they, when they actually had surgery. So, so you're looking at a big group of patients in the study who weren't actually anemic. Um, was it underpowered? Well, probably slightly because they aimed to recruit 500 and they didn't. It took a long time. It was very difficult to recruit to. I know that because I recruited to it. Um, and it was powered on a transfusion rate of 40 percent, which, you know, even at the time it felt high. Um, and it's no, you know, it's nowhere near that. And they, they saw it was actually only 29 percent. So, again, um, it was almost certainly underpowered for, for the primary outcome measures. Um, I've mentioned it was a it was a trial looking at open surgery. So how relevant are these findings for laparoscopic surgery, for example? Um, and you could argue that they they are not that relevant. And and also one centre recruited a quarter of the patients. So the practice within one centre really really I guess determined um, some of the outcomes of this trial. Now Toby would say and the, and the group would say that they accounted for all of this in the analysis and they you know none of this stuff matters and there's been loads of to and fro and I'm not going to get into the detail of that but I think we have to accept that there were some problems with, with prevent my personal issue though or my personal number one problem with it was that there was no guidance um, around who or why a patient should be given blood and I think this is one of the problems with um, trials in the perioperative space looking at transfusion or looking at a therapies for anemia um, is that if you don't control this and it's very hard to control. I'm not saying it's easy to control, but if you don't control it, how can you sort of really measure it? Um, because it's going to be centre dependent, it's going to be surgeon dependent, it's going to be anaesthetist dependent. I mean, you, you will have anaesthetists in your department who um, feel strongly that, you know, patients should be given blood more so than perhaps others. Um, and, that, and that's fine. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that that's reality, that we do vary in our practice. So if I were to be really, really harsh, I would say prevent as a cohort of mildly anemic patients who may or may not have been iron deficient, who may have been underdosed with iron with too short a time frame for it to have worked. So IV iron given in prevent may not reduce blood transfusion, whereby individual clinicians could decide what the transfusion trigger was used and under what circumstance blood blood was given. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of um, perioperative anemia. I'll stop um, sharing my screen. Thank you.